world news tonight. Better together. Thailand and Myanmar agree to aid displaced people amid escalating conflict. Mending ties. Leaders of Turkey and Greece agree to increase cooperation after years of tension. Court showdown. Former US President Donald Trump attends the Trump Organization's civil fraud trial in New York. And twinkling Gopio. Marking the festive season, Italy lights up the world's largest Christmas tree. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. This week's final broadcast begins in East Asia. Thailand's foreign ministry confirmed today that Thailand and conflict-torn Myanmar will create a task force to boost humanitarian assistance to people displaced by fighting. In a statement, it said that Thailand hoped the plan would lead to constructive engagement between military-ruled Myanmar, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations Regional Bloc, and the international community. Violence has intensified in Myanmar's border regions as an alliance of ethnic minority armies carry out coordinated attacks against the military, emboldening pro-democracy resistance fighters to target security forces elsewhere. The United Nations estimates more than 300,000 people have been displaced by fighting since the rebel offensive started in late October, among more than 2 million forced to flee since a 2021 coup and crackdown that triggered a backlash against the hunter. The unrest is the military government's biggest battlefield challenge since the coup and has alarmed China and Thailand with concerns about a refugee influx. The decision about the task force was made during discussions between a junta-appointed foreign minister Tan Sui and Thai counterpart Pan Pripat Dianukara at the Mekong Lanakan Corporation meeting in China. Myanmar's foreign ministry said in a statement that the meeting took place but made no mention of the humanitarian task force. A spokesperson for the junta could not immediately be reached for comment. The junta has been barred from attending top-level ASEAN events over its failure to implement a peace plan it agreed to after the coup. On to the Israel-Hamas war front now. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu threatened Hezbollah that Beirut will be turned into Gaza if it attacks Israel. This warning came as at least 350 Palestinians were reportedly killed in the past 24 hours. Rows of men stripped down to their underwear. Paraded in Gaza for all to see. Israel claims they've captured Hamas fighters. Israel does not arrest apprehend or target anyone in the Gaza Strip that is not a Hamas terrorist. They're put in the back of a military truck, later found sitting on their knees, hands tied behind their backs, location unknown. In Khan Yunus, moments after an airstrike. Some of the wounded lay on the street as the unhurt try and help. A ute passes carrying two injured men, but there are few places to take them. It's chaos. <laughs> At this ruined building, rescuers pass a little girl down to the crowd. She's carried away on a wooden plank. Another man is piggybacked from the rubble. There is no safety. There is no safe area, this man says. It's in Gaza's south where Israeli forces are now focused. Civilians repeatedly warn to leave and head to designated zones, but many can't or won't. Funerals are a daily occurrence. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken repeating public calls for Israel to do more to protect innocent lives. Israel has to make maximum efforts to avoid civilian casualties, even as Hamas continues to use civilians as human shields. In what will come as agonizing news for the families of hostages, the White House says another truce deal is not close. And this from a senior Hamas official. The possibilities of their return are dwindling and maybe there will be no trace of them forever, he says. What might be a glimmer of hope for those needing aid inside Gaza, an extra crossing inspection point to open, allowing trucks to be processed faster. Historic foes, Greece and Turkey, made significant progress towards mending relations during talks in Athens as leaders of the neighboring countries agreed to several cooperative measures after years of tension. 
Historical foes Greece and Turkey hope to usher in a new era of closer ties. In a landmark visit of Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan to Greece on Thursday, they agreed to pursue good neighbourly relations and work on obstacles that have kept them apart, especially in the Aegean Sea. By their acrimonious standards, Thursday's summit was a remarkable love fest without precedence. It went on longer than expected. Greek Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis addressed Erdogan as Dear Tayyip, and Erdogan said he expected to receive Mitsotakis in Ankara. This was Erdogan on Thursday. We want to turn the Aegean into a sea of peace and cooperation. As Turkey-Greece, we want to set an example to the whole world with the mutual steps we will take. I'm saying this openly. There is no problem between us that cannot be solved. It was a far cry from his last visit in 2017, when both sides reeled off a litany of grievances stretching back to the crumbling days of the Ottoman Empire over a century ago. Chile relations thawed markedly after Greece swiftly dispatched aid in the wake of a devastating earthquake in Turkey in February. The two neighbours, who went to the brink of war in the 1990s, have long been at odds over issues including where their continental shelves start and end, energy resources, flights over the Aegean Sea and the ethnically partitioned island of Cyprus. Over in the US, Donald Trump arrived at a New York court to attend his ongoing civil fraud trial, where his defense team is arguing that the former US president's family company did not manipulate the value of its properties to win favorable financing. In the meanwhile, the Department of Justice filed new criminal charges against U.S. President Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden, indicting him for allegedly failing to pay $1.4 million in taxes while spending millions of dollars on a lavish lifestyle. Former President Donald Trump was back in a New York courtroom on Thursday for his ongoing civil fraud trial, where his defense team tried to persuade the judge that his family company did not fraudulently inflate the value of its properties to win better financing. As he exited the courtroom, the frontrunner for the 2024 Republican presidential nomination deployed a familiar tactic, saying the state's attorney general who brought the case committed fraud, not him. The attorney general committed fraud. You just saw it right up there. She's a fraud. This whole case is a fraud. It's election interference. It's keeping me here instead of Iowa and New Hampshire. New York Attorney General Letitia James is seeking $250 million in penalties and a ban on Trump from doing commercial real estate business. The judge overseeing the trial has already ruled that Trump and his adult sons manipulated financial statements to dupe banks and insurers into providing favorable loan and insurance terms. Trump's defense team has called bankers and others who did business with the Trump Organization to testify that they did not rely solely on Trump's valuations in deciding to lend money to his company. On Thursday, a New York University accounting professor who does not work for Trump's company testified that he found the company had made an accounting error in one of its valuations, but he said he did not see any evidence of accounting fraud. We found absolutely no fraud, accounting fraud of any kind. This is a highly respected man. I don't know him, but he's a uh, expert witness, and he found no fraud whatsoever. In testimony last month, Trump complained of unfair treatment and acknowledged that he was involved in some of the documents at the heart of the fraud case. Trump is expected to testify again on Monday as the final defense witness. Major election updates on the road to the White House now. Donald Trump has gotten kid glove treatment from his Republican opponents throughout a crucial stretch of the primary season, and the numbers prove it. With each debate, the candidates have been more and more inclined to go after each other instead of Trump, the far and away leader in the polls. The trend continued when only Chris Christie, the lowest polling contender to make the debate stage, mounted sustained attacks on the former president. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley, entrepreneur Vivek Ramaswamy and Christie attacked Trump, President Joe Biden and each other across the four debates. 
The volume of attacks directed at other GOP rivals underscores how the debates have largely been a fight for second place. And coupled with polling indicating Trump's lead has only grown since the debate started in August, it may validate the former president's decision to skip the debates altogether. The candidates have spent little of their time in front of a national audience trying to take down their biggest competitor, Trump, who holds at least a 30-point lead in nearly every poll. In Wednesday's debate, the four candidates swiped at each other 28 times while targeting Trump on just nine occasions. Moreover, attacks on the former president haven't increased as the debates have gone on, despite his continued rise in the polls. In the first debate, when Trump had 52% in the national polls, the candidates leveled 10 attacks against the former president. He now sits at 60% but faces fewer attacks. Welcome back. Over in Australia, in a protracted wage dispute, the paramedics have rejected a pay deal from the New South Wales government, which had been described as a once-in-a-generation offer. A team of paramedics marching into a showdown with the state government over pay. I want to be very clear. The paramedics behind me, the paramedics in every regional and metropolitan station, do not want to leave, but they can't afford to stay. A fight both sides have fought before, but the stakes have never been higher. More than 2,000 paramedics have boycotted renewing their professional registration, which lapsed on December 1. Right now, working through a grace period expiring on January 1, meaning at midnight on New Year's Day, they won't be allowed to work. If this means that Triple O collapses on 1 January, it will be a disaster for the people of New South Wales. A disaster the health services union says can only be avoided if the government pays up, asking them to match what their Queensland counterparts are making within the year, which they say is 40% more. The peace offering from the health minister today falling short, pitching a deal which would give paramedics between an 11 and 25% pay bump spread over four years, averaging out to a 19% increase across the force. This is an offer, a once-in-a-generation offer. The likes has never been delivered or offered to our paramedics. The offer that's been put for over four years barely deals with the CPI at the, uh, increases at the moment. This year we saw a 4% CPI increase. I am trying to prevent a catastrophe. The government is trying to prevent uh, you know, a budget issue. Colombia and Brazil have destroyed 19 illegal gold mining sites and equipment in the Amazon rainforest. They were responsible for producing 6 million pesos of metal a month. Police said these sites were also contributing to local river pollution with around 100,000 grams of mercury per month. Authorities in Colombia and Brazil are cracking down on illegal mining in the Amazon rainforest. According to the Colombian Armed Forces, on Wednesday, the countries have destroyed 19 illegal gold mining dredges which are polluting rivers with mercury. Authorities reported that the illegal gold mines were producing about 23 kilograms of gold a month, worth some $1.5 million. The current bilateral operation is backed by the U.S. and targets facilities run by the transnational criminal group Familia del Norte. Those mines reportedly dumped around 114,000 grams of mercury, polluting 68 million litres of water every month. The former president of Sierra Leone has been called in for questioning by police over recent attacks that officials say was a failed coup. Police in Sierra Leone have summoned for questioning former president Ernest Baikaroma. That's as a part of their investigation into a failed coup attempt last month, the country's information minister said in a statement. Gunmen attacked a military barracks, a prison and other locations on November 26th. Around 2,200 inmates were freed and more than 20 people killed in what authorities later said was an attempt to overthrow the government. Karoma condemned the attacks shortly after they happened. The government said the failed coup had been mostly led by the former president's bodyguards. 
Thursday's statement said Karoma had been invited to report to the headquarters of the Criminal Investigations Department in Freetown within 24 hours. Karoma said he would honour the invitation. I maintain an open mind and stand ready to support the police investigation to the fullest, he said in a statement. Let the rule of law reign supreme in our democracy. Karoma also called on the public to remain calm. According to Sierra Leone's information minister, 71 people have so far been arrested in the ongoing investigation. They include 45 military officers, 7 police officers and 13 civilians. Italy has withdrawn from China's Belt and Road Initiative, more than four years after becoming the only group of seven nations to sign up. After months of uncertainty regarding Italy's involvement in the ambitious project, Rome conveyed its decision to leave in a recent letter to Beijing. Italy has officially told China it is leaving the Belt and Road Initiative. That's according to government sources on Wednesday. Italy became the first and so far the only major Western nation to join the trade and investment program, ignoring warnings from the United States that it might allow China to take control of sensitive and vital infrastructure. However, Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney said when she took office last year that she wanted to withdraw from the deal. She said it had brought no significant gains to Italy. The 2019 accord expires in March 2024. An Italian government source said Rome would not be renewing the pact. China's foreign ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin told reporters on Thursday that the Belt and Road has enormous appeal and global influence, without singling out Italy for criticism. China firmly opposes smearing and undermining cooperation in developing the Belt and Road Initiative and opposes confrontation and creating division among the camps. More than 100 countries have signed agreements with China to cooperate on Belt and Road Initiative since it was launched in 2013. Welcome back. An earthquake jolted parts of central Mexico. For more on that story and much more, let's take you around the world in a minute. An earthquake jolted parts of central Mexico, shaking buildings in the Mexican capital while sending anxious residents out into the streets in the quake-prone country. Hakodate city officials said in a statement that a large number of sardines and other fish had been spotted on a beach in Hamacho Toy District, adding that the cause of the mass fish deaths was unknown. The gunman shot dead by police after he killed three professors and wounded a fourth at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, was a financially struggling academic who was denied employment by several higher education institutions in Nevada. Thousands of protesters marched across Peru demanding the resignation of President Dina Boluarte on the first anniversary of her coming to power after the ousting and detention of former President Pedro Castillo. Taiwan's defense ministry said that 12 Chinese fighter jets had a suspected weather balloon had crossed the Taiwan Strait sensitive median line in a ratcheting up of tensions about a month before the island's presidential election. And that is all we have for you on World News Tonight. Join us again on Monday as we bring you updates from across the globe. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. Tonight, we are leaving you in Italy as Gopio lit up the world's largest Christmas tree, threatening the festive season. Thank you for watching. Have a great weekend. <laughs>